Hi, and welcome to the Bruce Channel. I am Bruce, and it's already been a week, huh? <laughs> I must have been having a lot of fun. I wish I could remember some. Anyway, we will start with, I think, the good people of California who have been through a lot. It seems like they're always going through something. For weeks and weeks, it was the wildfires. A couple of weeks ago, and for a couple of weeks, I've been talking about the wildfires. The Thomas Fire officially became the worst fire in California's history, and They've certainly had lots of those over the years, so becoming the biggest ever took some doing. Turns out the fire was only the first chapter. Now those places laid to waste by the fire have been hit with mudslides because, you know, without foliage to hold dirt in place, dirt just gets pushed around by the water, and it's so strong it pushes boulders. And we've seen that before. You know, vegetation prevents erosion, and whether it's because there's no rain which was what happened in the Dust Bowl in the 30s in Central America, or whether it's because fire burned away the vegetation, dirt gets moved, whether it's by wind or water. And the mudslides have proven more deadly than the fires. What, two killed in the fires, I think? Lots of evacuations helped that. But as I record this, nearly 20 reported dead, and they're worried they'll find more because lots of people are still missing. Imagine, you know, the fire is going on and you think you're okay, you think you're, you survived, you, you put it all behind you, and then this. And the other thing about these mudslides, you know, when Houston was underwater from Hurricane Harvey, one thing about flood, when the rain ends, the water will recede, it will evaporate. This mud, these rocks, they aren't going to leave by themselves. All right, so, so did you watch the football championship? It was perhaps the most exciting foot college football game I've ever seen, maybe of all time that anyone's seen. True enough, I would have been more pleased if my Buckeyes would have been in it, and I would have been more pleased had they won it. And to be sure, of the two teams, Georgia and Alabama, I wanted Georgia to win it, and I would have been more pleased if anybody but Alabama had won it. But what a game. Three years ago, when Ohio State won the very first college championship playoff, I was giddy, partly because they won it, but also because how they won it. At the time, before the season, their Heisman candidate quarterback was injured before the season even began, so the second-string quarterback had to fill in, and he filled in terrifically. And then he broke his leg in the last regular season game. So a guy nobody had heard of, the third stringer, Cardell Jones, had to come in and he guided them to three very impressive wins, and his legend in Columbus will never die. As a friend of mine said, he'll never, ever buy a drink, have to buy a drink in Columbus. So this week, Georgia looked like they had things going well. They shut out Alabama the entire first half. Nick Saban then benched their starting quarterback of two years and replaced him with a freshman. That seems like a, a desperate move, and it it was a desperate move, but the kid he put in from Hawaii, freshman Tua Tagovailoa. Yeah, he's from Hawaii. He could throw the ball much better than the other guy, and boy, did he. I mean, he brought them back to tie it with under four minutes left. It ended in a tie, 20-20, so they went to overtime. And college football does such a better job resolving ties and overtime than the NFL. It's fair. Each team gets the ball on the opponent's 25-yard line, and they play until it's not tied. You know, after each has had their turn. You can get a first down. You can do whatever you do. So Georgia scored a field goal, so Alabama had to at least score three. And the young quarterback, he went back to throw it, and he took a deep sack, way back, way back, almost midfield. It was going to be too far to try and kick a field goal. So on the very next play, he gets up, he throws a 45, 41-yard, hit the guy mid-stride. It was a perfect throw. Bang, into the end zone just like that. The game is over. Wow. 26-23, final score. Amazing. So I'm not pleased that Alabama won, but I'm pleased I got to see the game. And Mr. Tagobe, Tagobe Alua, he will be immortal in Alabama. And he'll never have to buy a drink. So, did you watch the Golden Globes? After all of the revelations and the Me Too movement, which of course began with the revelations from Hollywood, no one was sure what to expect. All in all, it was pretty well done, especially given that it 
could have gone badly. The women made a statement of solidarity, almost all of them wearing black, and Seth Meyers, he had to walk a tightrope, and he did it pretty well. His opening, <laughs> his opening was classic, given the atmosphere. Good evening, ladies and remaining gentlemen. I thought that was great. Even if you didn't watch the Golden Globes, you'll likely have seen the speech, or at least part of the speech, made by Oprah Winfrey, who was honored with the Cecil B. DeMille Lifetime Achievement Award. It was a wonderful speech. It was so good. It was empowering. But there were a lot of people saying she should run for president. I don't think she will. I don't think she should. But one thing's for sure. If she were president, she would, if nothing else, restore dignity to the office of president. I'm not even talking about his weekend's vulgar comments. I dare say every president has been vulgar at times. But, you know, midweek, they invited the cameras into a DACA meeting. It was designed to show how much of a leader he was, and it did exactly the opposite. He vacillated back and forth, whatever the person said last, okay. So one of his biggest critics was one of his former biggest cheerleaders, Ann Coulter. With the uh, holidays now in the rearview mirror, yep, we're back on track. We've got the Me Too's going. CBS News fired one of their executives because of inappropriate behavior. And now there's new accusations. You always wonder who's next. Well, new accusations have come up regarding James Franco. All right, too late for my deadline last week, but we learned we'd lost Jerry Van Dyke. His biggest role was on the TV show Coach, and of course he'd had roles for decades, either the star of some shows, or the co-star, or the star of a bad show, My Mother the Car. He had a lot of good guest starring roles, too. I'm sure he was comfortable, but I always imagined what it must have been like when he and his, his brother, the far better known Dick Van Dyke, would get together. Was he jealous? Probably not, but... You'd think he had to wonder what might have been. Anyway, a year ago, I showed you a clip from you know the Disney production special in which Dick Van Dyke surprised the audience and came out and did a little step in time. Hmm? Surprised the audience. It was more like shock and awe in a good way, in a good way. Anyway, owing to Jerry's passing, I was reminded of that special. And, you know, it's just over a month since Dick Van Dyke turned 92. You know, as you may recall, from time to time, I suggest we send thanks to those who have brought us good times. And so I'm going to send to Dick Van Dyke. And if you'd care to join me, the address is Dick Van Dyke, 23215 Mariposa de Oro Street, Malibu, California, 90265. So, I'd mentioned Oprah a few segments ago. From time to time, I've waxed fondly about YouTube, how it's created such a treasury of valued moments you know, if you want to revisit something special, like the Dick Van Dyke episode, of the special, the Disney special, that's on YouTube. But I wanted to tell you of something else. One of the wonderful things about YouTube, of course, we can go back and see things, you know, before there were recorders. Um, I was on a business trip years ago, years ago, and my wife at the time, when I got back, she said there had been a number of special episodes of Family Feud that week. Different casts from old TV shows had returned. And among them, Lost in Space. And that was the one I was especially sorry to have missed, because I loved Guy Williams as Zorro. So I you know, just wanted to see what he looked like at the time after lo those many years. Well, you know what? It's on YouTube. <laughs> and of course, a real treasure 
Robin Williams. We all miss him. But thanks to YouTube, his genius can be visited and revisited and treasured. He was a genius. This week I found one of those. He and Nathan Lane were on Oprah as part of a promotional tour for their new movie, well, new at the time, Birdcage. And I suggest you look for it and watch it. The whole show is, it is hilarious. But without commercials, it's only about 40 minutes. If you do, at the very beginning, the video is a little bit, a little bit squirrely, but it clears up pretty quick. Anyway, here's a sample. Okay, I want to see you do the John Wayne thing. Well, it's, you know, Oprah, get up with me. We'll make you walk like John. Okay. Okay. Wait. Wait, wait. I need to look better. Well, Nathan, Nathan, first, didn't you have a who taught you to walk like a woman? How, who taught you to do all that? Oh, uh, um, Roy Halland, actually, who was the sort of the chief makeup artist, had spent a lot of time in heels, and uh, and he showed me where how to how to how to walk and where to how you Roy's carry yourself. Roy's the guy who looks like Carol Channing at the end that says Bob Dole looks gorgeous. Oh, that's him, really, yeah. really. Oh, okay. Carol Channing is a very hard one to pull up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, all right, what do you have to do? Oh, Chris, don't okay. be afraid. Imagine Jerry Springer's down the hall. Okay. What you do is you get in there, you open a little saloon door, and you walk in and don't be afraid to pretend you're packing heat. Well, that's good, too. <laughs> Like a couple of 38s to start the day. <laughs> Fire off that D cup, and here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Walk with me. Walk in there. You know, John had a way of walking. Let it go. I feel like I should be going, you can't go. <laughs> Baby, it's a miracle. Drop the crutches. You had a, but you have to imagine that you actually have a knee joint. You walk like that and, you know, move along. And occasionally... I still can't do it. You still can't do it, yeah. Like, this is like John Wayne. It's like John Wayne in chorus line. One incredible sensation. Again, I suggest you look for it. Big fun, I promise. Hey, let me tell you about my book, Shrink. Or wait, I can let others do it. Welcome back. Remember, you can watch us, you can write to us at the Bruce Channel at yahoo.com. You can watch us at our Facebook page or at tinyurl.com slash Bruce Channel. All right, so you know, there are overnight news shows. There weren't always. In the long ago, stations aired infomercials or old movies. In the long, long ago, they played the national anthem and signed off. But CNN and 24-Hour News changed that. Ted Koppel's Nightline was one of the first. It wasn't overnight, but it was a late-night, genuine national news program. And it came out in response to the Iran hostage crisis. A little over a decade later, now we've got the Gulf War going on. So the broadcast network, CBS, ABC, ABC, created overnight news shows. Now, all of the overnight crews are less formal than their daytime counterparts, but ABC even less formal than the other two. Yeah, they do the news, of course, but they also let their hair down. <laughs> the very first World News Now, that's ABC's entry, aired January 6, 1992. So that's the backstory to where we're going here. Seven months later, it was a Friday. And remember, I, I, I said they let their hair down more? <laughs> yeah, they debuted a new ending to the week. The show ends at 5 a.m., and to this day, it, or any number of versions of it, 
continue to close the show on Friday at 5 a.m. What is it? World News Now ends the Friday version with the World News Polka. This one was the first. Come on, wake up. Let's polka! Clinton's on the campaign trail. Bush is golfing with Dan Quayle. That's the World News Polka. Weatherman says looks like rain. Guess what happened with Hussein? That's the World News Polka. It's late at night, you're wide awake, and you're not wearing pants. So grab your World News Now mug and everybody dance. Have some fun, be a pal, every anchor guy and gal. Do the World News Polka. Come on, everyone. That's the World News Polka. All right, Perot supporters only. That's the World News Polka. Who needs ratings? Who needs sponsors? Who needs networks too? And if your neighbors call the cops, here's all you have to do. When they yell, it's half past three, tell them, hey, it's news to me. That's the World News Polka. Do the World News Yeah, that's Barry Mitchell, a sometimes correspondent, sometimes comedian, sometimes musician. World News Polka. <laughs> I love the way he referenced Koppel's show. And uh, it was 1992, so yeah, he was also referen referencing the uh, presidential candidates, Bill Clinton and George Bush. In those days, didn't have to say George H.W. And even Ross Perot. All right, coming up this week, in addition to Friday's World News Polka, 5 a.m. Eastern Time, <laughs> today, Sunday, today, Hot Pastrami Sandwich Day. I'll tell you what, among my favorite memories of Columbus is the uh, hot pastrami sandwiches I'd have almost every night. Mm, they were good. Oh, and likely because it's January, this is soup month. Tomorrow is hat day. It's true. <laughs> if you're not a fan of perseverance, if you're easily sidetracked from a task, you may especially enjoy Wednesday. It's it's Ditch Your New Year's Resolution Day. Truth. All right, so whether you ditch your resolution or wear a hat tomorrow, it's also MLK Day on Monday, of course. Whatever you do to celebrate, I hope your upcoming week is the best you've ever had. <laughs> <laughs>